Welcome to How to Split a Toaster, a divorce podcast about saving your relationships from True Story FM. Today on the show, have you ever wanted to split your lawyer? The divorce perspective in the toaster today. Welcome to the show, everyone. I'm Seth Nelson. I'm here, as always, with my good friend, Pete Wright. And today, we're talking to Jamie Ainsworth. Now, we have usually have professionals on these shows to talk about getting through the divorce process. But, Pete, I looked far and wide and found someone that's been through a divorce and is willing to talk about Seth, it. Seth, that's pretty rare in your line of work is actually find one in the wild. Exactly. Now, Jamie was not a client. She actually lives in the great state of Louisiana, but she was with her husband for 20 plus years, married for 17. They have two children. She'll explain that to you in a little bit, but we wanted to welcome Jamie Ainsworth to the toaster. Jamie, thanks for joining us. Thank y'all. And I'm actually thrilled to be considered part of the wild. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. It's aspirational. Yes. This is an aspirational position. going to totally add that to my goal list. All right. We've been talking about all of the supporting professionals that exist in and around the service of the legal process and the emotional process of divorce. But we've never talked to anybody with the specific intention of talking to them about how all that worked in practice. And so we thought it would be a great opportunity to bring Jamie on the show. Uh, You, uh, Seth, have known Jamie for a, a very long time, apparently, I hear. We've been very good friends for a very long time. And I actually was at Jamie's wedding and know her former husband very well. He's a great guy. And I know Jamie, correct me if I'm wrong, but you've spoken to him and said, hey, I'm thinking about going on the toaster. Is that okay? Absolutely. One of the things we've done well is communicate. And so it was deserving of him having that input. So let's start with this question. How long did you think about a divorce before you actually verbalized it to him or to yourself or to others. Yeah, I'm ready to move forward. Probably close to two years. And it was verbalized to him first. Well, yeah, you should know that in terms of toaster bingo, I think our I think we'd said it was three yep. years. It was, if Seth were to be right, it would be three years. So That's you've just average, him though. wrong. That's an average, Pete. <laughs> okay, all right. And, all right, for and those the disclaimer score, of if Seth were to be right. nice yes all right so uh, it took you close to two years to to figure it out what was what's that experience like when you're climbing that particular mountain oh we could go the therapeutic route and talk self-reflection how do you improve a lot of times it's just a lot of frustrating conversations before you wake up one day and go holy cow this is not where i want to be this isn't productive for any of us. And I kept going back to, I am not my best self. So when I was prepared to say it out loud, it was to my husband. That's when the more soul-seeking counseling kind of process started. So when you You, first say it out loud to him, are you out? Are you like, I want a divorce or I'm thinking about divorce? Are you still going through that grieving process? How did that work for you? Literally laying in bed, waking up and saying, I don't want to be married anymore. And those were the words that came out of my mouth. Pete, how does that hit you happily married for 20 years, brother? Yeah, I'm not going to lie. It gives me a great deal of anxiety. (laughs) I think we're doing fine, but I want to bake a cake for my wife right now and just make sure every day is just further cementing the next morning. (laughs) This is why, Jamie, we appreciate you having on the show. Pete has never been divorced as I have been. And I think the feelings that you're willing to share with us today are felt by many people. Mm -hmm. During my divorce for a while, I just felt like I was living someone else's life. Then I guess, Jamie, that's what you're saying. It's not your best self. Does that equate to you? I, by nature, am also a thinker and a planner. I could easily be called one who overanalyzes. So there were a lot of thought processes that went through not only how I'm impacted, but obviously how he was impacted. Family, friends, children, pets, insurance, electric bills, the works. And I had already processed through most of that alone. 
then doing it with him and doing it in counseling helped verbalize the things that may not have come out politely in the process, if there's such a thing in divorce. But we made every effort to be as polite to one another as possible. When you talk about those words coming out of your mouth that morning, do you have a sense memory of what you expected? And how did that differ from what you got? Bad answer, because it's always a blur. Like that whole... I'm going to say that initial six months was a blur until we spoke to attorney, we put things in writing, the the process began, the legal process began. It's an emotional blur. Yeah. And it's a that. roller coaster. It's right, Jamie, like one day you're doing better. Or I feel like we're on the right path or oh, I can breathe again. And then the next day you're choked for air. And yes. then there's oh, we didn't think about this as much of a planner and thinker that you are, things come up and we have to deviate from that plan. And how do we deal with the kids? And did you jointly decide how you were going to tell the kids and how all that played out? We did, and it wasn't immediate. Um, And it was something that we discussed in counseling before we made a plan together. We have two children. One came with Brian from his first marriage. She was very young at the time. And so I She's mine. People will ask, how many kids do you have? Two. Although Sarah is technically a stepchild once removed, if that's possible. See, I get asked that she same question. She is 26 year old. I get asked that yeah. same question, Jamie, and I answer, it depends on how you count. And you would think <laughs> I should know how many kids I have. <laughs> but the way discussion like, are, are you counting fence posts or the spaces <laughs> like yeah. is, that, is that what we're That's dealing what, with here i have one biological child i have one child who was my stepdaughter for a time being because i was married to someone who as jamie had a child from a previous relationship and then my girlfriend has two kids so the way that i describe it i have four kids in my heart i have one biological i have to pay for half of one college It actually works out very well for me. (laughs) But isn't that interesting, Jamie, how you say it? Like, you've been with this child for how many years? And legally, you're no longer a step parent. But that doesn't change the bond that you have with that child or that child with you. Is that what you're telling us? Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's and while it's easy because we have good relationships, it is very intentional. and. Just because something is easy doesn't mean it's intentional. And I think those of us who have gone through divorce realize that you can do a lot of things with intention. Hopefully they're with good intention, but we made mistakes. Before we we talk about your mistakes, which I would love to hear all about your mistakes, Jamie, (laughs) being good friends for so long. (laughs) But get back to how you told the kids in, in how that felt, how they responded, how you focused on them. I'm sure you were prepared and if not over-prepared, if that's possible. (laughs) We did not do it at anyone's home because we didn't want that memory. We were very conscious about going to actually a restaurant outside that we don't normally go to, that it's not someplace they're going to go to and have memories. Oh, that is planning ahead. I would not have thought that far ahead. it, it is. And yeah. I think Brian and I both come from divorced families. Some things that work well and some things that don't. And actually, that was a move that the counselor even suggested, is think about their long-term mental health and where was, these I, discussions I was, go. Yeah, I was wondering, what restaurant will you never eat at again because of how your parents told you? That kind of question. What memory has been horribly disfigured in your history? Jamie's (laughs) never going to Burger King again. (laughs) Yeah, right. No, I'm done. Evidently, my parents did it okay. I don't think I'm scarred. Uh, I guess if you could see me Uh, and twitch a little bit. (laughs) You no longer are going to go to McDonald's and order a Happy Meal when you're going to tell your children about the war and about what's going on. never be happy (laughs) again. I, and I hate balloons. Oh, and bears. <laughs> I'm never going to the circus again. Um, no, but so, that, that's a very good point. It's usually the idea of a, new, a neutral territory for the kids on the psychologists and mental health professionals that I've spoken with have advised you never do it in the child's bedroom or in that creepy front living room with the plastic over the furniture that no one sits in. 
you do it. <laughs> Describing a mafia hit zone? <laughs> Come on, Pete. Didn't your grandparents what? have that room in the front that you're not allowed to go into because you're going to spill on the furniture and they had plastic over it? Oh, man. We come from very different places. You were in a log cabin somewhere. I forget. <laughs> anyway, so you don't want to be in anywhere where it's like they walk by and that's creepy or that's where it happened. Some therapists are like, yeah, where do they play their video games? If it's not in their bedroom, if it's like the family room, but then don't it, do it there. No, it's actually say that's not a bad place because oh. so many other things happen there. It's not oh, okay. like the one thing. Like yeah. you're saying, the kids are never going to eat at that one restaurant Jamie went to. But <laughs> it's interesting to get different points of view on what psychologists are, are advising. Yep. And this was January of 2019. So the kids were 14 and 24. So there's a yeah. substantial age gap between them. They are both very mature kids. Um, do, do you find that that age gap? I, I want to poke at that a little bit. Do you find mm-hmm. that? How has that impacted them now that you're over a year out? Do you notice any differences between how they relate to you in vis-a-vis the divorce? I, I don't think it's in relationship to the divorce in the sense that the older also graduated from vet school and moved to Texas. Yeah. So the distance there was coming anyway. Mm-hmm. COVID has played a whole new role in wrapping up a divorce virtually. 14-year-old is under roof, and the three of us all spend still a fair amount of time together. She plays sports, she's active with social life, and we don't want to miss those things individually. Mm -hmm. So we choose to do them together. So there's still quality time and good quality time spent together. Right, it's not, it's just different, right? But when your kid's out there on the soccer field and she looks over on the sidelines, mom and dad are standing next to each other just like they always have been. Absolutely. In fact, I think there's some folks who see us regularly at sporting events who may not know. Yeah, that that, that sounds like something to maybe hang your hat on that if it's if it was such a chill divorce that you can still do those kinds of things with one another, that's a big deal. And I don't know, is that a rarity? Pete, you made an assumption. And by chill divorce, it doesn't mean what Jamie went through was easy or there no. wasn't stress. You Surprising, know. I looked up chill divorce in the Black Law Dictionary <laughs> and, and it actually says not easy, but communication was high. I would, agree with you. So. I would agree with you that chill is a great way to describe it. And in lighter moments, Brian and I had conversations about we wanted to be the poster children for if divorce had to happen, we want to be the ones who modeled it. It's not a favorite. It's not a first pick. But goodness gracious, if we're going to do it, let's be mature. Let's continue the respect we have for each other. We spent a lot of good years together. No reason to change that. Man, I hate it when Pete is right. I hate it when Pete's Pete right. right. I know. Pete, who's always right, like I hear it all the time. I can't check the box. I can't control no. it. <laughs> but it takes two to do that, Jamie. You've had friends that don't have the quality relationship that you have with Brian. Yes. I think it took the two of us, but we were also very fortunate to have supportive friends, supportive family who could be chill sounding boards easy sounding Mm -hmm. boards and sometimes folks had to look us in the face and go snap out of it get a grip um why would they why would they need to do that because and i'm my own perspective i won't speak for him on this i worked so hard at wanting people to understand what was their business and be sympathetic to those reactions overthinking again Mm -hmm. and it was my mother that said this is not their divorce. Quit, quit dealing with everybody else. Quit dealing with all the other. Oh. Deal with you. Deal with Brian. Yeah. Deal with the kids. Get a grip. Thanks, oh, Mom. That's really interesting. Love you too. I have friends that are in the legal profession. I have friends that are great social workers and counselors. Those folks rallied to say, oh, look, don't do that. That's stupid. <laughs> And 
that's beneficial to hear, straightforward, get a grip language, cut through the fluff because there are other friends that I had that were the hand-holding, back-patting kind of friends. And then sometimes you just need friends to say. What she means by that, Pete, hand-holding, back patting you might not know those terms. That means went to the bar and had tequila shots. Okay. <laughs> I'm too Southern and genteel for that. I, I do want to talk about splitting the social life, like that experience of splitting splitting friends. Did that come up? Because it's something that seems to be in difficult divorces. That's a, one of the things that is a challenge. That's an ongoing challenge. We haven't resolved that. I'll come back in a year and tell you about that one. Jamie and Team Brian that were battling when you guys were working so hard not to battle? Like your mom mm. saying, don't deal with all of their other shit. Focus on your life, your yeah. kids. How many other people got divorced as a result of your divorces? I think what we're asking. Just so they can stay on Team <laughs> yeah, Jamie. Yeah, no, that Team hasn't Brian. happened. That okay. hasn't happened yet. Right. But it, it part actually, of our... though, Pete, or Jamie, just on that point, Pete, statistically, divorce happens in clusters. I'm right. Wait, again. <laughs> again? Again. In twice Seth, in one tell show. Me, bring it. Tell me more. <laughs> so divorce, it's not uncommon. In fact, it is common where I say clusters, where you have a friend that gets divorced. And within that group of friends, it will start to happen. Wow. From a total sociology perspective. You just need somebody in a community to break the seal. Break, break the ice. And, and know that it's okay. Yep. Mm -hmm. oh, um, that's a little bit grim for me. Yeah, that's why I have no married friends. They're like, that shit happens in clusters. Seth got divorced. Stay away. He's contagious. <laughs> oh, he's got divorce. So, Jamie, uh, how is it when you're out with your married friends? Do you feel like a third wheel? I know we're in COVID times. That's and exactly. Do people happen. go out anymore? Yeah, no, people right. don't go out. We, I haven't had those experiences yet. Uh, in total honesty, we, our divorce was final in May of 20. And no one has had a social life since. <laughs> now, not to disparage the great state of Louisiana. And this is always why I say check your local, check your local jurisdiction. jurisdictions. Pete's favorite words out of my mouth, Jamie. But in the great state of Florida, if you want to get divorced in Florida, you just have to be a resident of Florida for six months before you file. But once you file, I can get you divorced in 21 days. That's the quickest I can do it without getting leave of the court to do it quicker. Because if you have a whole agreement, Pete, all the money's worked yeah. out, all the kids stuff, uncontested divorce, you file it, you can go in front of a judge 21 days later and get divorced. Jamie. How long in the great state of Louisiana? 364 days. Wow. That's almost all the days. <laughs> all the days. And that's from <laughs> filing. So there's the, the pre-filing work that still has to lead up to that. We sat and waited more than we were active in negotiations. So what other people have told me, Pete, is in some states like Louisiana, where you have to wait that long once you file, mm -hmm. it prolongs the fighting. It, that wasn't the case for Jamie, thankfully. It wasn't. It wasn't. We were unique in the sense that I hired the attorney, Brian did not contest it, and we shared her legal services. But check your local jurisdiction. Oh, see, Jamie's picking up on my I language know, she's right there. so good. Is that an okay thing to do? Seth Nelson Esquire? Not in the great state of Florida. It I didn't a, think so. It is is it allowed? It is a conflict of interest. I can only represent one party in a divorce. And I think technically our attorney only could represent me. But since we came to the table in full agreement, she was able to process the work. He was able to show up at her office to sign. I think technically by law, she only represented <laughs> Right. He may have been technically representing himself. I, I do yeah. yeah, that was I, the air quote. So that's probably yeah. my gut tells me that's probably what happened. I'm very cautious when it comes to this area because I don't want the other party to think that I represent them. So they will have to sign. I represent your wife. I only represent Jamie. My allegiance and loyalty and 
duties run to her. I can totally screw you out of everything on and mm-hmm. on. So I, in my practice, would not ever have an opposing party come to my office to sign. I'm that cautious about it. Now, other wow. lawyers that I know are like, yeah, no, it's fine. We send it to them. It's no big deal. I'm just very cautious because I don't want to even give the perception. I don't recall any signed agreements, but I do recall her on a few occasions repeating who she's hired by. Uh, it really wasn't controversial. And and that is that is an area of pain for a lot of people. And I think the, the anxiety around working with an attorney, hiring attorney, the cost of an attorney going into the divorce process, how much of that stuff impacted you and Brian? I think we were very fortunate and it, it didn't. We both knew this attorney in town by reputation. I, in fact, told him that's who I was seeing before I went to see her. That is not the experience that I have heard anecdotally from other folks going through the process. And I think as going through the process, the questions that I was prepared to ask the attorney, I had a long list of them. included things philosophical. It included things like... Oh, lawyers love those questions. I know, (laughs) but I wanted to know who was going to represent me and my interests because I'm not an attorney. That's not a philosophical question for us lawyers. That's just who's your client. So yeah. literally in law school, but they have this thing on when does the attorney client relationship begin? And you should know that when you're talking to a lawyer, check your local jurisdiction in the great state of Florida. It's when the client believes it begins. Someone calls me on the oh. phone and they say, Hey, can I talk to you about my divorce? I say yes. There, it's all attorney-client privilege. They believe that's when it started. So this is how they teach it in law school. I'm sitting at my desk. Pretend I'm sitting at my desk here in my office. You all know I'm a divorce attorney. And a guy runs in with blood on his hands. And he says, I killed her. <laughs> Will you represent me? And I'm like, I'm a divorce lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> a wrong door. And so now can I be called to testify against this guy that just admitted that he committed a murder and he invokes the attorney client privilege and the other side says, no, he never met Seth before. He didn't sign a retainer agreement. He didn't pay him any money. And they asked the guy, did you think he was a lawyer? I knew he was a lawyer. How'd you know? I saw attorney at law right on his door and I went in there and I thought I needed help from a lawyer and I thought everything was attorney client privilege and I talked to my lawyer. If he believed that I was his lawyer and I was going to represent him, attorney client privilege, I can't testify against him. Is that a jurisdiction thing or is that just lawyers? So it's you always have to check your lo- local jurisdiction because all of when the attorney client relationship start is usually governed under state law. But yeah, wow. it's when the client believes it to be. So literally, we run conflict checks. Because if someone calls me, I take down their name, I take down their spouse's name, I make sure that I haven't talked to the spouse or anyone in my law practice hasn't talked to the spouse. And if they have, I just say, sorry, I can't represent you or continue this conversation. Why is that? I'm sorry, I can't share that with you. There's a conflict. Wow, this is great news. I need to go back to figure out when Seth and I met because I may in the future have needed an attorney in the past and you're it, man. (laughs) Everything you've done or will do yeah. is now set no, I believe. I now oh, believe. Right. I believe. <laughs> yeah, there's a problem with that, Pete, is your wife's had me on retainer for a long time, brother. <laughs> oh, nuts. <laughs> so, that's Jamie, amazing, yeah. Back that's, to that. You, that's, I'm sure I know Brian very well. He's a smart guy. He knew that she was representing you and not him. Yes. And again... This wasn't normal from the way I understand divorce is. He and I talked through every step. When it was time for disclosure, we made the lists together. We bounced off of, okay, what about this? What about your retirement? What about... We did our best to write some sort of an agreement before we took it to the attorney. Because our time was cheaper than hers. Sorry. I I am all for this. I am 100% for people saying... This is the way that we want to do things. So if Jamie would have come to me with that agreement in Florida, 
My job then as the lawyer is to not get in the way. My job mm-hmm. is to say, Jamie, under Florida family law, you would be entitled to X. Brian would be entitled to Y. This is how it all plays out. No matter what your agreement is, as long as you have that information and you understand you may be giving up the farm, you may be getting more of the farm, you may be do- doing one thing that the court would do, but not another. That's okay as long as you're making an informed decision because it's the client's decision. It's not my job to tell Jamie, oh, no, we're not doing that. That's absolutely not my job. My job is to say, here's what the law is. Here are your choices. You've made your choices. Now do you understand? Yes. Do you still want to go forward with that choice that you've made a handshake deal on? It's not written. It's not enforceable at this time. Yes, I do. Then we proceed through that. Uh, And I think that was our experience. Yeah. So, Jamie, what are some things that were easy? Maybe I have to put that in air quotes. And some things that were just really hard or unexpected that you didn't know you would think about or feel. Oh, so I think you alluded to it in the beginning. It depended on the day because I still take the trash to the road and go, it'd be nice if you were here doing that. (laughs) I still have that, (laughs) those thoughts. Sitting down to eat when your teenager is running the roads and you're eating alone. You think, huh, alone. Now, I think my perspective is to reframe it in alone isn't so bad, and it's very different from lonely. Uh, And in COVID, I've embraced the alone. I found I could be antisocial after all. Uh, What's easy and what's been hard? How you've impacted other people with your choices. And it, it circles back to a friend group. We both had separate married lives and then a together married life. The separateness just continued on. The, the group that we shared, the group that we would vacation with, that we've been to each other's weddings, seen children be born, new pets come into the family, the whole nine. Those are the folks where some days there are tendencies of side taking. And it's not intentional because I think all of these are good people who truly want the best for both of us. But we're human. We all have this selfish need to say, y'all's divorce is going to affect our vacation. <laughs> and that's a good point. So yeah. many people, and we've talked about this before, Pete, is when you tell them their knee-jerk reaction is, how does this impact me? Yeah, right. Yeah. And like your mom said, Jamie, deal with your stuff, not their stuff. Right. And we'll come full circle because we'll deal with it as we as we meet other folks, as we bring other people into those group relationships, we're going to have to do more processing in the future. I have one friend in particular who has been very point blank. She says, I'm not ready yet. (laughs) I'm not ready to meet new folks. I'm still processing this. I know you're happier, but I'm not ready yet. About either one of us dating. she's still processing your divorce? Yeah. (laughs) And she's not ready for either one of us to have a a separate oh. relationship that's not us. That was on the list of our, our potential questions for you is, I know this is still fairly recent in, you know, geological <laughs> terms, uh, <laughs> but how has your divorce made you re- rethink future relationships? Oh, that's a big one. <laughs> I have learned a lot from divorce. Some of it came through counseling. Some of it comes from the ongoing conversations that we have driving out of town to a soccer game and we spend an hour in the car together alone. There's great processing time. I think we've continued to make apologies to each other, but the conversations over time have driven more towards what we would do differently. Would we discuss money differently in a newer relationship as 50-something, speaking of geological time frames? Yeah, and all all I'm thinking now is prenup. Very possibly. I'm nowhere near that discussion. But will I have more forthcoming conversations about money? Previous spouse relationships. There's those things. I'm more self-reflective of what's important to me. And I regret not vocalizing that in our marriage. I think I was better at it through the divorce. And I know I'm better at it now. But you lose yourself along the way when you don't speak up. I've learned. Oh, speak up. As we get toward wrapping up here, just a couple of practical questions. 
How would you characterize, for those listening who may be considering a divorce themselves, the scope of detail that you had to keep in the air at any given time? Well, Seth is going to roll his eyes, but I have a spreadsheet for everything. <laughs> Remember we had someone that said spreadsheet was yeah, a love spreadsheet, language? Spreadsheet, spreadsheet, spreadsheet. That is yeah. Jamie Ainsworth right there. There you go. I, I really enjoy my list. And sometimes it's a downfall because the people around me and who live with me have to understand that there's a list. <laughs> yeah. And you, you may or not may not be on it at any given moment. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so I will share this. I, I juggled this is a fair a very, amount of detail. This okay. is a very quick story. I dated a woman when I was in my early 20s and I went to visit her family, sat down, met the dad, had a beer, sat in the same chair. They said, oh, sit here. So I sat there in the living room. Next day, go down, sit down, have a beer, sit in this chair in a cross on the sofa there was a throw pillow that was not there the day before and it was a list and it had my girlfriend's name and it said her name and it said she loves steve with a line red stitch through it john with a line red stitch through it al with a line stitch through it and then seth no line yet Talk about the ultimate list. <laughs> wow. What? <laughs> Seth. <laughs> Scarred me for life, became a I divorce mean, attorney. That's what's been wrong that with you ever it. since. <laughs> that was it. It was a throw pillow. Did it happen to be on a Visqueen covered couch at any point in time? How did you know, Pete? Thank oh, you, Pete. My goodness. Is this Thank where we now tell everyone that I dated your sister when my early 20s? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, okay. It's a lot of detail. Love the spreadsheet. What other uh, experts outside of your attorney did you did you call on? You've already mentioned you're, you you were working with a counselor, a therapist of some sort. Anybody else uh, who was on your team? Friends and family. Okay. Some came with divorce experience. Some came with legal experience. Some came with social work experience. Some are teachers, educators in a faith-based profession. I have to reflect upon the fact that everybody has something to offer, but if you're not prepared to delineate what's valuable to you in your decisions, you can prematurely ask for help. That makes sense. Um, That's everybody has just, opinion. Right. And if I hear what you're saying, Jamie, if you're going to ask for the opinion, then you get to accept it or not, or you can take a piece of it or not. That's also true even when you don't ask for their opinion because they might give it anyway. But just because they're given it doesn't mean you have to take it. Absolutely. And don't ask if you really don't want to know. Yeah. What if anything was easy? Well, it's all relative. So my quick answer is nothing is easy. But being prepared, have an open conversation, having professionals that you trust made the process way easier than it could have been. Although I would never define any of it as easy. You got to go through mm -hmm. it. Can't go around it, over it, under it. Yeah. You got to go through it. You sound mm -hmm. like you're doing well now, though. It, it's new opportunity. And there are rough days. And there are more good days than rough. And we look at it as growth potential. We both do, and we yeah. remind each other of that. One, you've gilded a cage of luckiness with hard work and diligence and open communication, and that's that's to your, your credit to both of you. Thank you so much, Jamie, for coming to the show and sharing your experience. It means a lot to us and to listeners to, to hear that sort of vulnerability. We really appreciate that. Absolutely. And I, I thank you all for letting me get out of my comfort zone. This is not something that I would normally sign myself up for. Thanks for making it easy. The only thing easy was coming on the toaster. <laughs> Maybe so that was chill. it. Uh, <laughs> the toaster's so chill. Do you hear that, Seth Nelson? I heard it. Black's, you had to send your Black's Law Dictionary. You had to send your buddy a bottle of wine. I think Jamie's got a nice <laughs> bottle or something going out to something's Louisiana. Coming. Right, something's, something's coming. coming. <laughs> Jamie, thanks for taking the time. I know this wasn't necessarily easy, but I also know you want to share and help others. You, I've known that about you for a very long time. And give our best to Brian as well. I will. 
Thank you, guys. And thank you, everybody, for downloading and listening to this show. We certainly appreciate your time and your attention. On behalf of Jamie Ainsworth and Seth Nelson, I'm Pete Wright. We'll catch you next week right here on How to Split a Toaster, a divorce podcast about saving your relationships. Seth Nelson is an attorney with Nelson Coster Family Law and Mediation with offices in Tampa, Florida. While we may be discussing family law topics, how to split a toaster is not intended to, nor is it providing legal advice. Every situation is different. If you have specific questions regarding your situation, please seek your own legal counsel with an attorney licensed to practice law in your jurisdiction. Pete Wright is not an attorney or employee of Nelson Coster. Seth Nelson is licensed to practice law in Florida.